Hey guys, and welcome to the Prompts and Prompting Masterclass. We are actually going to be talking about prompting in Alpha Crafter, but we're actually going to take it a little bit further here at the beginning and talk about prompting in general. A lot of us started using the LLMs early. We didn't have these cool tools like Novel Crafter, so we had to do it the old fashioned way. That was like a year and a half ago. It's still the old fashioned way. It feels like 10 years, right? So just a quick what we're going to cover. So we'll talk about the definition of a prompt, the anatomy, as well as an example. We'll also discuss mega prompts. And then we're actually going to talk about the different types of prompts inside of Novel Crafter. Then we'll actually go and play in Novel Crafter, which I bet is what most people are excited about. I'm going to give you a resource for advanced prompting, as well as some pre-submitted questions. And actually one of those folks is here. So we will go over their question. Okay, so let's get started with what is the definition of a prompt? It's probably going to be, I don't want to say it's a little bit boring, but it is very fundamental to understanding how you interact with the LLMs. So if any of you are new-ish, I would say, to what an LLM is, it's basically like a big database and it has like words and phrases and what you put in determines what you get out. So a prompt is a piece of text or a command that gives an AI language model, or sorry, given to an AI language model to guide it in generating a specific response or output. So it's a starting point or instructions that tell it what to do. So that's when I'm going to get on my soapbox here for one second. When people are like, hey, it's just a computer that's giving you output and you're not really writing. That's bull honky. OK, you are the one that is directing it. It is your input that is providing that output. If that's not creativity, I don't know what that is. OK, so let's move on to the anatomy of a prompt. So. There are, you can have a very simple prompt, write a short story, or tell me what this concept is. You could put in, hey, tell me what an LLM is from the perspective of a eight-year-old. And you can make things really super easy to understand. I actually, on Father's Day, spent probably two to two and a half hours explaining how AI works to my dad. And one of those things I told him was, is go in there and say, explain this to me as you would an eighth grader. And just explaining him, giving him that resource really opened his eyes to what is possible with LLMs. Okay, so let's talk about the anatomy. So you can give it instructions. So what's its primary, primary directive or the task that you wanted to do? You can also give it context. And this is something that we do quite often as fiction writers. So we will set the scene or give it background information that the LLM will need to be able to give us the output that we're looking for. You can also give it details. And remember, I always say to be specific. So that's where that specificity comes in. So you're giving it names, locations, plot points, or other details to guide it when it gives you your output. Also, tone and style. So how do you want the output to sound when you get it back? Do you want it to be humorous? Do you want it to be formal? One thing I like to say is I like to instruct the LLM to give me information back and Oops. Sorry, I put something in my way and distracted myself. Told you guys. Have it respond to me casually, also friendly versus there's one of my friends has a GPT and it responds to you in a scornful manner or very sarcastic. You can tell it how you want to interact with it. If you want to create maybe a GPT that is a book coach and have it respond to you in like a like a drill sergeant manner and pull up your bootstraps and such 
that you can do that as well. On to the format. You'll actually see quite a bit when we get into Novel Crafter talking about how it the format needs to be when you get that information back. You can either have it in paragraph form, a bulleted list, as a script. Another way is as dialogue is another one for the format. Or I want it back in a markdown format, which is one of the ways that we actually see that pop up inside of Novel Crafter. And then any kind of constraints, any kind of limitation that you want on the response. Do you want a certain word count? Do you want to avoid certain terminology? Do you not want it to include violence? I know all of us are probably like, we want to add more violence, right? This is a very using the examples from above. So your instruction is to write a short story. The context is in a small coastal village during the 1800s. You'll never see me writing this story because I don't like historical fiction. Like so your content details. So focus on the young girl named Clara who discovers a mysterious ancient map. Tone and style, whimsical and adventurous. The format written in three paragraphs. That's not really a story, guys. It's flash fiction. And then the constraints. So you don't want to mention any kind of modern technology because it's in the 1800s. So that's just a very basic uh, version of what a prompt is. And do you have to have all of these things in your prompt? Absolutely not. You can have one or two or three things. But the more pieces of information that you have without going overboard, the more specific your prompt is going to be, the better output that you're going to get. So let's talk about mega prompts. And this is a term um, that I first heard when I was in Future Fiction Academy. And we were building these massive mega prompts. And actually, the engine Brexy is built to create mega prompts that you can use to get really specific and consistent output. So a mega prompt is an extensive and detailed prompt designed to provide comprehensive guidance for your LLM. So it's going to have multiple components to ensure that it's highly specific and you end up with relevant output. So they are handy when you want to have a precise, nuanced, and aligned with con the uh, complex requirements, such as when writing a fictional story. So some benefits of using mega prompts. And I will tell you some of the mega prompts that I put together uh, just even last year when I was doing, because remember, when I was doing NaNoWriMo last year, Novel Crafter wasn't a thing yet. It was, it was a thing, but it wasn't available to us yet. And so I had these massive mega prompts that I was putting into Claude to be able to write these stories. And you also have to think about what was the context? What was the token limit back then? And you had to be very specific about what you put in there. You couldn't put very much in a Claude 2 because you had a context window. I can't remember, 32,000 tokens, I think, back then. It's silly. Now, when you go and you look at the context windows that we have now, I think Gemini has 2 million tokens if you want to try to use that, I personally am not going to use Gemini. I do know some people that are. So some of the benefits, so you have clear and comprehensive instructions. You're going to reduce the ambiguity and give it less room for it to improvise. So if there is, if you're solving for X with an LLM, it's going to put in whatever it wants to put in there. So that, again, that's another reason why when we do work with the LLMs, we want to be very specific. Also, okay, again, specificity, consistency. So again, you want to get the consistency. So every time I run this prompt, I want to have this specific output. That kind of reminds me of the theme brief prompt that I have been working with. I want my theme brief to look a specific way every single time. And so that's why I built that prompt. So I have consistent output. And also efficiency. By using these mega prompts, we're able to be more efficient. And lucky for you guys, if you are using Novel Crafter, you are using a mega prompt. So there you go. Ta-da. You've, I don't know, if, uh, 
I sit down and talk to people and I'll be like, the reason that Novel Crafter works so well is because it is a mega prompt. And so that's why that's why we get the kind of output that we do. And changing the prompts that we're using, changing the, the amount of information and what we include in the AI through the codex is what drives the machine. So I will stop for a moment uh, before we dive into the individual types of prompts and open it for questions. So I can get a drink of water. You guys are very quiet. Are you still alive? Yeah. Have I killed you? It's we are not a question, not a question, but, uh, okay, yeah. not a question, but something that might help. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been, I guess, using the LLMs as long as you, one thing that I find is really useful, like before starting, not only just to ask it questions is if you plan to tell it to do something mm -hmm. and you're not sure if it knows how to do that thing or it knows enough about it, just ask. Absolutely. Oh. I can't remember the, there's three or four different personality type structures mm -hmm. and some LLMs know them really well and some know them not at all, certain ones, and some are partially good at it. And so if you just go ahead and throw those into your story, into the codex, and then expect every LLM to treat them the same. It can be disappointing. So that's one of the things that I always ask. So if I know that those are in my character codex entries, then I will go and before I start using them, I'll just ask the particular LLM what it knows about a, a, a given type, a character definition type. And if it's good, then I know to use it. If it is racially confused, then I see I'd have to lay it out for it. You don't have to not use it. Then you just have to give it that information to start with. Exactly. So that's something you can put into a codex entry or a snippet. And then you just have to make sure that whenever you're working with it, you reference that entry or that snippet, depending on how fancy you want to get. It, it, it also depends on why it doesn't know it. So if it doesn't know it because it's making an error when it returns the response, mm -hmm. then you're correcting it. Sometimes <laughs> in the specific case, it will, the response that it'll return will just say, oh, that's not scientific. That's not scientifically based. So don't use that and don't talk to me about it. So then that it's been tuned away from that and to either not use it or you have to redefine things for it. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Another way that we can use that, I actually did this the other day, is when I was getting ready to start coming up with premises for the Halloween short story, I asked it, what do you know about Monster in the House beat sheet when it comes to Save the Cat? And it was able to give me a pretty good definition, as well as the three things that you have to have when you have Monster in the House. Yes, I definitely, I did that the other day. I was like, do you know what monster in the house is? And most people probably don't know what the heck I'm talking about. But when we get to starting to work on the Halloween project, we're doing a short story. You guys will learn a lot more about monster in the house and also the other different beat sheets that are available through Save the Cat. So let's go ahead and we're going to dive into Novel Crafter and let's talk about the different types of prompts. Now this, I took a picture, basically a screen capture of my novel crafter. And yeah, you can see I have a lot of workshop chess prompts because I put them all into our AI size AI toolbox, but I have much less of the others. And I actually made a scene summarization one, like while I was putting this together. So that it now has two. So we've got scene bleat, scene beat completion prompts. So that's what we're going to use when we're going to write or continue the prose from scene beats. I just did a nice little screen capture here. We're actually in the write area. I tried to make sure that it was clear where we are when we we're using these as well. And we just, whenever we put in our beat, we come down here to generate prose. 
this is my new one, my scene summary, prose generation, and then you're able to continue writing or start writing if you are at the beginning of your uh, story. I actually put in here an example prompt preview. You could actually come here and hit uh, preview final prompt and you'll see your mega prompts. Very cool. But I put one that's an example from the Mafia Codex. And then we'll go on to scene summarization. The scene summarization prompt basically allows you to summarize the content of previous scenes so that it can be included in the story so far. When we start looking at, when we dive into uh, Novel Crafter, I'll show you where the story so far is, but I actually went ahead and highlighted it right here. This is the general purpose scene beat completion prompt. And you can see the story so far and context story so far. But what that is, summaries. And I can show you, oops, right here. This is how you go in and summarize your previous scenes. Yeah, that's if you want to get them short. You can actually use the default. I changed mine because I think that 50 words is a bit low for my previous scene summaries. So that's a personal thing. But I'll show you how you can go in and change that if you want to have longer summaries. Text replacement. Now, this is one I haven't played with all that much. If any of you have used PseudoWrite, one of the big draws to PseudoWrite is the tools that are actually in the system for when you are writing. And you can actually expand, rephrase, shorten. You can actually add all kinds of different description. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but I was an early, I used PseudoWrite for a while. And I'm going to remember what they called them. Laser tools, I think was what they called them. Or at least that's what Nicole called them. And so, yeah, that's text that you already have and you are enhancing it or you're changing it. And I think I was watching a video by Jason Hamilton the other day. And I think he has actually a bunch of extra, he has more of his than I do. Someone's joining us on the phone. Like, okay. So my favorite, because you guys know how much I enjoy playing in the workshop chat. Those are the workshop chat prompts. And so that allows you to give instruction, some context, format, and or constraints to information coming from the LLM when you're working in the workshop chat. And it also allows you to get more consistent output. So this is actually a screen capture of output from the blurb copywriter prompt that I have. And so you're actually able to say, using the hook, pitch, and premise, please write me a blurb for the story. And every time I use it, it comes out pretty much the same because I have told it in the instructions what I want it to give me back. Okay, now we're done talking about all of this stuff. We're going to go and we're going to play inside of Novel Crafter before we get in there. Any other questions or anything that you guys would demonstrate it specifically? Otherwise, I get to be in control. That's why I'm an author. Oh. Okay, looks like I'm running the show. Okay, let's go into, we'll go into Eris's Gambit. I will remind you, if you are a member of the AI Toolkit, you guys have Veil, Veil Breaker, which is the Urban Fantasy Codex. Not a lot of people have downloaded it, but I just wanted to remind you guys it's there. And it's only available to you guys. Don't forget it's there. We'll go into Eris's Gambit. That is our, I think, the one that I've played with the most, at least recently. And so there's two ways, really, to get to your prompts. So here's one way. You're inside of a book and you come here to prompts. You can see them all here. The other way is if you're just here on the main page. And I actually like to, if I'm working on prompts, I usually come this way. Just hit prompts. And there's a lot less stuff. 
Okay. So let's go and we're going to take a look at the general purpose scene beat completion prompt. When we come in here, as usual, you've got the name up here. Now, this is one you can't edit. There are the system prompts are ones you can't edit. If you want to make changes, you actually have to come up here and hit clone. Just when you're getting, just getting started, you do have quite a few prompts, but then you become like me and then you collect them or you make a bunch and it quickly gets out of control. I am out of control. So here we go. We've got the different models that you can use. And then if you come over here to instructions, this is where the magic happens. And I think that a lot of people are worried about coming in here and breaking something. Let me remind you that you can't break anything on these system prompts because you can't edit them. So if you clone it and then you start making changes, then you have opportunity to break it but you have to actually clone it to make some changes. The first thing it says here is, so you are an expert fiction writer. So we're telling the LLM what information that they need to have, what kind of experience or what kind of knowledge that we need it to have. And then we tell it, always keep the following rules in mind. And then we've got quite a bit of information here about how we want it Are you, anyone else having issues hearing me? No, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Okay, okay. Sounds good. If you want to, yeah. Okay. We will give you one second to check your settings. I know my mic or my headphones, they stop working after 15 minutes for some reason. That's why I had to go buy this really new, huge mic. See, this is what happens when I look at the chat. I get lost. Okay. Okay. I'm going to keep going and then you can just check the recording for this. I actually think you also can try logging out and logging back in as well. That also might help. Okay, these are just some basic style rules when it comes to putting the prose out. And it's telling it to go look at the novel tense as well as the language of your novel that you've already put in to the system. Show, don't tell, adverbs and cliches and overused phrases. And then it also tells it to take into account the following characters, locations, items, and lore. And then it pulls codex entries. So this is where it's pulling the, the codex information. And it's only pulling the codex information for items that are in the AI. So those are the items that are literally marked, hey, AI, put it in every single one. And for the ones that you have marked or have called out specifically in either your scene summary or in your beat. So those are the ones that it's going to pull. And then if there's anything else that is attached to it by being a nested entry as well. So that's another thing, other things that it can pull as well. And then we've got the story so far, and that's going to be the previous scene summaries. So if you're in scene five, it's going to pull scene summaries for one through four. If you're in scene one, there is no story so far. And then down here, it has some code. If start of the scene is equal, then it's going to continue with the scene, the POV characters and a previous scene context that goes into code. I'm not going to make myself look silly by trying to explain this to you because I don't understand all of it either. But it also pulls words before. So if there's any other words that are before it, it's pulling in the context of that. So this is within the actual scene itself, I believe. I will get back to you on that. But the previous 2,000 words. So keep that in mind. And then down here, it talks about the point of view and the current scene beat. So don't end with foreshadowing. Don't write further than what I prompt you to. 
avoid imagining possible endings and never deviate from the instructions. Also, stop early if it's going to deviate from these rules. So these are the things that are already baked inside here to help you with your pros. And I'm sure they had to go through tons of iterations of this prompt to figure out, hey, what is it going to break? <laughs> What's not going to work? But it gives you some pretty decent pros, even if you don't have in your own style guide. Other opportunities you have here. If you look at my, this is my experimental one that is currently inside of the toolbox. This is my scene summary one, and it's actually pulling in. So take into account the following information about the scene. And so it's actually taking in my scene brief. Because right now, it doesn't pull in the scene summary or the current scene that you're on. And that's what I need because that's my scene brief. So that's why I made it the change to the one that I'm using. And I also edited some of this other information in here as well. So this is actually available right now in the toolbox. Let's see. This is the one we did the video on short stories. So this one allows you to create a short story and have the short story be in an act. So it only takes into account the stuff in the specific act that you're working in. So you can have different short stories in the same book file. This one has the short story by chapter. So the short stories are contained within a specific chapter versus the previous one where it was in a different act. It definitely needs some other tweaks to it, but that's just to get you started. With those, uh, I also have one I created. I just, it was the general purpose one. And I, I all I did was I marked the checkbox for not safe for work. Uh, the short story by chapter prompt might be good for serial fiction. Probably not. If you want it to be able to communicate what's going on, and if you don't want your story, the different parts of the story to be able to talk to each other, then I wouldn't use it for serial fiction. Now, for serial fiction, and this is actually one of the questions that we had. So the person who was asking the question had over 500 chapters already. And even if there's 50 words per chapter, 500 chapters, 50 words per chapter, that's a lot of, of tokens that were going towards the story so far. They asked, is there a better way to do this? And Spacey Motion had said that the best way to do that would actually be to use act summaries as opposed to scene summaries. And unfortunately, at this time, act summaries aren't built into Novel Crafter. So there's actually two ways that we could have done this. So we could either use a codex entry that has the summary for a specific act, or we could also use a snippet. And so what we did here is, so summary of the previous act in the story, and we actually had a codex entry called act. In this version, it was act X. But this allowed it to you have an act so far versus scene so far because that scene so far would have been 250,000 words roughly or tokens I should say 250,000 tokens also there is you can do it with, with a snippet so the summary of the previous act in the story and you could do act one summary and that would actually be the name of a snippet any other questions about that it's a bit you're playing with code at this point. I avoid it. I know it ought to be can, dangerous. Can we call a snippet? Makes sense? Okay, great. Yeah, because if you're doing a serialized story, unless you're doing a serialized story where you're like, you've got X number of characters in book one, or I would say, I say book one, season one, and then you're changing to other characters in season two, you actually still want to be able to talk those characters should still know each other, theoretically. The world should still be the same. So you can set it up as different books and then just have some things in the codex that are series codex entries, or you could do it in the same 
same file. I actually wouldn't do that, but you can do that. Okay, let's go and play in a novel. I actually was, so you can see here in my scene one, I've got our POV character here is Zara. And this is the heiress's gambit. So this is the mafia romance. This is my scene summary. And as you can see, it's quite large. But because I use a scene summary, I don't have to use really super long beats. A lot of the information that would be in my beats is actually in the scene summary. And so that's why I do it that way. So this is my scene beat for the next scene. I actually went in and made some changes. I extended it. I gave it some other information and actually created a new character. So I actually gave the character a name. It wanted her to try to call her best friend. And when I say it, I mean in the chat. So we can actually go in here to generate pros. And we'll use the one where I talk to my current scene summary. We'll use Sonnet because I've been loving life with Sonnet these days. And we'll just let it go. Now, the only thing that I really messed up on this one is that for some reason, my character, if she has any kind of internal dialogue, it's not italicized. So next time, I need to make sure that I'm very clear on that. So actually, the first part of the the beat, I actually took two beats and I put them together too. So that also helps. So she gets a text from a, num a new number and it makes her drop the phone. So that's, this is the first half right here. It's so the first 166 words. And then she is going to retrieve her phone and she is going to dial her best friend Melanie's number and she's not going to call her because she realizes she's actually out of the country. So that's the second half here. Oops. And yep, the second 170 words. And um, it came out pretty. This is a sample codex entry. So I'm sorry, a sample codex. It's not going to be great. If I were writing this book for real, there would be a lot more here. It hopefully would be a lot better too. But yeah. Okay. So let's go play in the workshop chat. Actually, before I do that, I want to show you really quick if you want to. change the scene summarization so let's say for instance you want more in your scene summary than just 50 words you can come into the end actually we'll go to the default you'll clone it and you'll change don't write more than 50 words so i actually changed this to don't write more than 500 words so it'll be considerably longer i wouldn't do this if you are writing a super long book but I tend to write short stories and novellas, so I'd actually like to have a longer scene summary. So then, yes, I went ahead and I changed it to 500 words. And I actually didn't know this was here. Let me show you. If you come back here to the plan view, you come here to the three dots, summarize scene. Now you can actually see, you can either use the defaults or you can use the one that you created and actually come in here and do it. I'm not actually going to change it because I'm going to leave my scene summary there for now. How I would use this as far as process goes. So after I wrote this scene and I was getting ready to go on to scene, either scene two. Yeah, I've got scene two in this chapter. I would come in here and I would summarize it before I moved on. There we go. So now let's go to the fun part, the part that I like to play with the most. I like to play with chats. And we will look at the different prompts we have here. And you guys are familiar with the fact that I have been making a lot of developmental editors. And there was a question 
what is the difference between the different developmental editors? Garage door. Oops. I thought I turned the chime off. Sorry about that. So I have the various developmental editors. What is the difference between them? And actually, let's come here into the toolbox and I'll show you where they are. So if you come down to Novel Crafter Prompts, the developmental editors are here under Workshop Chat Prompts. And we scroll down. There are two sections. So we've got this section here that's got different genres. And then we just have some other more random ones that I haven't built more to go with. So if you come here, all of these are dark romance. All of these are romanticy. So they are based on genre. And then some of them have tropes as well. So epic fantasy is a genre one. I think all of these are genre ones. I think the sweet romance one might have tropes in it. Hold on one sec. Okay, sweet billionaire romance. So that's a genre with a trope, billionaire. Enemies to lovers, big relationship. So friends to lovers. So yeah, that's what the difference is between the different developmental editors that I have so far. So most of them are different tropes and combination of different genres in some case, some occasions. So there. That was the answer to that question. Let me know, because you are here, if that answered your question. Okay. So, yeah, depending on what I'm writing, I'm going to use a different developmental editor to do that. We will use Cozy Romance here in honor of our friend Kate at Novel Crafter, because she writes Cozy Romance. Okay, we'll come here to the instructions and... Really, the big change between all of my developmental editors is this first paragraph right here. That's where the difference is. So you are an ex expert developmental editor who specializes in writing warm, comforting, cozy romance stories for adult audiences. You have extensive experience crafting and refining narratives that emphasize gentle love stories, endearing characters, and intimate settings with a keen understanding of the unique conventions and reader expectations, you ensure the cozy atmosphere and heartwarming relationships are the focus point of the story. You work with authors and they will ask you questions about their story and you will answer them. So that's the instructions to the LLM. It's telling that who they are. It's telling them what they know and how we want it to respond to us. If you, any of you guys have done GPTs, it's very similar to a GPT. You're telling it who they are, what they know, and how to respond. And it's very similar to all the rest of them as well. I don't think I created one yesterday for the young adults, but I don't think I put it in this. I didn't put it in here. I put it in my, this is my personal one, my personal level crafter. I actually have a one for Bite Size Booksmith as well. And I just don't use it. I probably should get rid of it. So we come here to the Generate Scene Brief. This one is a bit more technical, I should say. So we're actually, and this is actually based off of a mega prompt from Future Fiction Academy as well. So you're a helpful ex expert assistant to a novel author. And you're writing a scene brief for scenes in the story genre. So you actually have to have a story genre codex entry right here to get this one to work. And then it's going to include the characters and characterization, setting information, story world information, plot elements, and step-by-step -step instructions or beats to write the scene. And then it's going to, it tells it to read this specific information. So this is actually telling it to get all of the location codex entries. So it's pulling everything under location. So it's pulling all 12 of them. It's telling it to pull all of the characters. So that's what the code there means. So it's pulling the nine characters 
as well as the scene list, which is a entry called scene list. And then it continues to answer their questions and basically have a conversation if it doesn't know the answers. And so that's one of my experimental ones. I call it experimental because again, playing with code and taking something that I've used previously the hard way, and trying to make it easier. We looked at the log to be the blurb copywriter earlier. So this is, you're a copywriter adept at crafting blurbs for a, diver a diverse range of fiction genres. I'm actually working on a couple more of these blurb copywriter ones for different audiences because different audiences want different things in their blurbs. So this is a way that you can take something like that I've already created and personalize it. So if you can actually put examples, okay, I'm losing my voice already. I'm going to take a drink of water. This always happens. You can actually put in an example of a blurb that you like in here, either in the actual content or context of the conversation, or you can actually put it into the instructions. And that's another option. So if there's a, a specific style that you like in writing your blurbs, you can do it that way. You can use other people's blurbs as an example, but don't copy. Active scene beats. This is using the scene beat template that I had gotten from Mira Gold. So I'm going to stop talking for a few minutes. I'm going to open it up to questions. I think we're at that part of the conversation anyway. Oh, here we go. Advanced prompting. Sorry, we'll come back to questions in a second. There is this really handy dandy article from the that are available from Novel Crafter that talk about the different prompt functions and the way that they are used. So if you want to get perhaps a snippet, this is how you would add a snippet into your prompts and any information from your current scene from contact, from the information actually about your novel. Actually, oop, went to the wrong place. In your novel settings, any of the meta metadata or like your tense language point of view and whatnot. So you can actually pull that into your codex entry and the functions of how to do that are here. It also talks about logic and I'm sure it talks about if then possibly statements. Not a coder, but it does have some really good examples and screenshots as well. So we, now I'm going to go back to what are your questions? I've actually already, I think I've answered these here. As I finished off this bottle of water. I have a question. I'm not sure if this is too technical or whatever, but like I, I use chat quite a lot uh -oh. to. Uh, am I there we go. Now you are. I oh, remember I said every 15 minutes, my yeah. headphones turn off. So if you would have asked me a question before in this moment, I wouldn't have heard you. All right. There we go. Maybe this is too technical. Let me know if it needs to go to somewhere else. But I, I've been using chat quite a lot to help develop the codex entries, not just like for the content that goes in the first time, but the more entries I end up with and the more that happens in the story, the more I want to make sure that I don't miss any updates or conflicts or that kind of thing. And so I'll often, when I know that developments have happened in the story or that I've added things to the contact or to the codex, I'll tell chat to look at a, a batch of them and then tell me if there's any conflicts and how it recommends resolving them. So I guess the, the question is. I'm telling it to go and look at codex entries and then in the same chat, it'll you know, give me responses. Usually I ask it in such a way that it just gives me pretty good ways to update it. And then I just copy paste those in the, where they ought to be. So now I've changed the same entry that I told it to go and look at. Mm -hmm. Do you know when it, I haven't tested, so I don't really understand. Do, do you know when the chat sees the change? So say I say, what are some good changes to make to this character's description? And then it says, oh, you should make these character, uh, these changes to the character description. So I just copy that and paste it into the exact same codex entry. 
And then from, is it just anything from then on automatically knows, or do I need to leave that chat, start a new chat for it to I don't know, take effect? If, okay. So let's say you're using this active scene bead. You refer to the scene list here, but then you go and you change the scene list down here. Right. It's going to look at the new scene list as soon right. as you change it. So it's everything after that and inst instantly basically, right? So okay. after, yeah. For instance, like I will, I will tell you guys, oh goodness, why did I go to this one? I don't know why I did that. When I start, a lot of times all I will have is a framework. So I'll start a codex with just the framework. And when I build it out, it, it adds, I'm building entries and I'm referring to things that didn't exist yet. But then when you go to look at the chat, they will exist, but it's like after the fact. It's okay. definitely a mind. Yeah. Well, one of the things that makes it confusing is it makes, at least when I've been doing it, maybe it's how I'm asking it. I mm -hmm. ask it to make suggestions. And if I don't say those suggestions, one, three, and five are great, but the rest are trash. Don't use those. If I don't explicitly say don't use those things, it just assumes that those suggestions are yep. law. Yep. And so it's looking at whatever I put in the codex entry. But it's also assuming that I'm okay with everything else that it suggested anyway, unless I tell it not to. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot of times what I'll do is this is how I took your, I took what you said into consideration and this is how I've edited it. Okay. So it's just another response to it. To yeah. It. yeah. It. I will. That's how I typically do it and handle that situation is, okay, you said this, but this is how I interpreted it. I had this happen a lot when I was doing beat by beat in Claude. That was awesome, but at the same time, it was a lot of work. This is how you interpreted it, but this is how I rewrote it. And that that seemed to work in, in the Claude chat interface, at least. Same thing holds here. This is what you gave me, but it wasn't quite right. So I can either say that wasn't quite right and I can give it bullet points of what I wanted to change or I can just rewrite it myself and feed it back in there. Those are my two options. Cool. Thanks. Absolutely.